Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Jamie Owen. Welcome to the programme. Our top stories, Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will now send new delegations to Egypt and Qatar for talks on a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of Israeli hostages. Our other headlines, at least 70 more Palestinians killed in the latest attacks on Gaza amid further warnings of famine. Power plants damaged and civilians injured. Kyiv says Moscow has launched another attack on its energy infrastructure. And an eight-year-old girl is the only survivor of a bus crash in South Africa that killed 45 people. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has now agreed to send delegations to Egypt and Qatar for talks on a possible Gaza ceasefire. Israel withdrew its negotiating team from Doha earlier this week, saying talks were at a dead end. At least 71 Palestinians have now been killed by Israeli strikes in Gaza over the last 24 hours. That's according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Israel's foreign ministry has said it will expand aid deliveries into Gaza after the International Court of Justice ordered the unhindered flow of humanitarian supplies. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent Alex Cadier in Tel Aviv. Alex, um, so why this U-turn on the talks then? The international community obviously piling on the pressure. Well, Jamie, a lot of pressure from the international community, as you said, from the United Nations uh, Security Council, which Benjamin Netanyahu just a few days ago had blamed uh, for the reason why Hamas had uh, not accepted the last proposal accepted by Israel in these ceasefire negotiations. And the, that delegation, which had been in Doha for eight days, was pulled back by the prime minister, saying that clearly Hamas had no interest in reaching a deal, and that was the damage done by that UN. Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. Well, three days later, now the Prime Minister's office saying that uh, Ronan Barr, the head of Shin Bet, the Israeli security agency, and David Barnier, the head of the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, will be heading back into these negotiations with enough of a remit to negotiate. Now, let me remind you of the last terms uh, that were uh, put on the table by the United States and accepted by Israel. 40 Israeli hostages, women, the elderly, injured, uh, would be released in exchange for 700 Palestinian prisoners, including 100 serving life sentences uh, for murdering Israelis. Now, Hamas rejected that offer because Israel refused to withdraw all of its troops from the Gaza Strip and allow complete, the complete return of civilians to the northern parts of Gaza. That and the UN security resolution is what prompted uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu to pull back his negotiators which are now back into these negotiations. Uh, the big question now is whether or not they will have enough of a remit to strike a deal, and that we'll see in the next few days, Jamie. The talks about talks continue, but so too does the military action. Israel carrying out strikes uh, on the Syrian city of Aleppo. Um, what more do we know about that? Yeah, well, Jamie, as one front possibly quietens down with those ceasefire talks, another may well open up, and a much uh, more uh, dangerous one, as it were, uh, that northern front for Israel against Hezbollah. We uh, have reports from the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is a UK-based uh, war monitor, saying that 42 people were killed in those Israeli airstrikes in the last 12 hours or so. 36 of those are uh, Syrian military personnel, five of which are members of Hezbollah, confirmed by Hezbollah. And in just in the last few hours in uh, southern Lebanon, Jamie, we understand that Israel uh, uh, had a drone strike that killed uh, Ali Naim, the deputy commander of Hezbollah's rocket unit, that rocket unit which has been striking uh, into northern Israel, forcing the evacuations of thousands of Israelis living there. So certainly the real concern, the real fear over the next few weeks may be a potential escalation with Hezbollah are something that the international community, the United States, have put a lot of pressure on Israel to avoid any escalation in the north. But certainly those ceasefire talks uh, trying uh, against hope to have a deal between Israel and Hamas may quieten down the war in Gaza, may quieten down the war in the south. 
but that may lead to uh, or may uh, then see another escalation in the north. So see, uh, clearly a very fluid situation, Jamie. Alex, thank you for that. Our correspondent Alex Cadier in Tel Aviv. Let's take you next to uh, our correspondent uh, Akram al Satari in uh, the city of Rafa in Gaza. Akram, dozens uh, killed overnight uh, in Israeli strikes across Gaza. What's your sense of uh, the picture there today? Well, the, as you have just said, dozens were killed overnight and dozens are killed also today. In the last two hours or so, around 23 Palestinians were killed in different incidents targeting different areas of the Gaza Strip, one of which is in al Shajaya, which was the bloodiest, where around 18 people were killed, one of which is in Gaza central area and the Zahra area where five people were killed and one in Khan Yunus where two people were killed. So the situation is still escalating and the bombardment is still intensified and the people are still falling dead or injured because of that ongoing bombardment. They also, the Israeli occupation army has been targeting different residential buildings in Az Zahra area where around 21 out of 24 residential buildings were targeted and reduced to rubble. Another residential building in Khan Yunis area, which also has around 20 uh, apartments, was also targeted and destroyed. So overall, the situation still uh, is still extremely tense, and the bombardment is intensified. And it's the life of the people in Gaza that is being the invoice of that ongoing bombardment and escalation. What do people in uh, Rafa uh, make of this uh, promise by uh, Israel's um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to push ahead with uh, the next uh, military campaign into Rafa? Having lived those six months of a bloodshed and continuous bombardment, people in Rafah and also internally displaced people who are sheltering in Rafah are well aware that the Israeli occupation army has already approved the plans to attack Rafah and they cannot count too much according to them to the political talks about the situation and about the smart solutions that were proposed by the American administration to alleviate the suffering and mitigate the expected number of people killed and to bring about a smooth movement of those people to different areas in the Gaza Strip. People see a bloodshed coming to this particular area in Gaza Strip, which is Rafah. 1.3 million Gazans were worried. Tens of thousands of them moved already from this area to other areas in the Gaza Strip. Some, some of them moved to Gaza Central Area. Some of them moved to coastal area in Khan Yunis, which is called Al Mawasi, and that was described by the Israeli occupation as a safe area. So people understand the escalation is coming, and they have been seeing themselves the bombardment getting intensified in the last few days. In Rafah, we have around 40 people killed in the last 36 hours. We have more buildings that are being targeted. We have more areas that are being targeted, and people believe that this is all a preparation for a larger scale ground operation that is going to bring about more destruction, displacement and devastation. Akram, thank you for that. Our correspondent Akram al Satari in the city of Rafa in Gaza. An eight-year-old girl is the sole survivor of a bus crash in South Africa that's killed at least 45 people. The bus was carrying Easter pilgrims from Botswana when it hit the barriers on a bridge, fell into a ravine and caught fire. The accident took place in the northeastern province of Limpopo. The authorities say some of the bodies are burnt beyond recognition. The first crane has arrived at the deadly bridge collapse in the United States city of Baltimore. Authorities are hoping to remove thousands of tons of debris so that the city's port can reopen. A container ship hit the bridge on Tuesday after losing power with six people presumed dead. Jeffrey Donaldson has resigned as the leader of Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party with immediate effect. Uh, that's after confirming he's been charged with historical sexual offences. An unnamed 57-year-old woman has also been charged. Earlier, Donaldson deleted his entire social media presence. Gavin Robinson has been appointed interim DUP leader. France's foreign minister is visiting China on Monday. Stéphane Sejon will hold discussions with his Chinese counterpart, Wang Yi. 
Beijing and Paris are marking 60 years of diplomatic relations. Sejong's visit is the second to China by a French foreign minister in less than six months, following a trip by his predecessor in November. Christians are marking Good Friday in Jerusalem with a procession through the old city despite regional tensions. Worshippers annually retrace what's thought to be the route that Jesus took to his crucifixion. The event coincides with the third Friday in the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which has seen tight Israeli restrictions at the city's Al-Aqsa Mosque. You're watching CGTN Still Ahead. More Russian attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. We'll be reporting from Kyiv and Moscow next. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTF. I think it should be more global cooperation. I would like to hear more the voice of the developing countries. Globalization has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The green transition has to happen, so it's, it's, it's a necessity. Well, China and, and the United States are, are important powers in the world. What unites us is much more than what uh, divides us. And I believe China is committed to this agenda. Join me, Juliet Mann, to set the agenda at these times every weekend on CPTN. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just gotta be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Hello, welcome back. A reminder of our top stories. Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will now send new delegations to Egypt and Qatar for talks on a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of Israeli hostages. Our other headlines, at least 70 more Palestinians killed in the latest attacks on Gaza amid further warnings of famine. Ukraine's armed forces say the country's energy infrastructure has come under attack by Russia with a mass barrage of nearly 100 drones and missiles. At least six people are injured and power is said to be cut in several regions. Russia has escalated its attacks on Ukraine in recent days in apparent retaliation for recent Ukrainian aerial attacks on the Russian border region of Belgorod. Well, let's talk to our correspondent Megumi Lim in Kyiv. Megumi, uh, what more can you tell us about these latest attacks on Ukraine? Well, that's right. Russia launched another large-scale missile attack uh, targeting almost every region across Ukraine. And it appears that Russia is indeed uh, stepping up its attacks specifically against Ukraine's energy grid, as we have seen over the, this past week alone. Attacks against Ukraine's power grid has happened and taken place almost every other day. And in this latest attack, again, we have seen several energy facilities being hit, uh, according to Ukraine's uh, biggest private energy company, DTEK. Three of its power plants were severely damaged as a result of uh, these attacks. And this latest attack comes exactly a week after, according to Kiev, Russia launched its biggest assault on Ukraine's energy infrastructure in the two years of war uh, last Friday, where, according to President Zelensky of Ukraine, more than 60 uh, drones and 90 rockets targeted regions, again, all across uh, Ukraine, uh, 
damaging thermal power plants and also causing a massive fire to break out at the Dnipro hydroelectric uh, station and also leaving millions without power, especially in the eastern region of Kharkiv, uh, where the attack was uh, the worst. And to this day, a week later, uh, people in Kharkiv ha are still without electricity, many of them, and uh, electricity has not yet been fully restored in that area. Now, and two days later, on March 24th, again, uh, attacks were carried out against Ukraine's energy facilities, leaving several areas of Ukraine without power and heating. Now, this latest attack, though, comes after President Zelensky said he had a phone call with uh, U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson telling him how vital it was for the U.S. Congress to uh, pass additional military aid for Ukraine, this military aid package that has remained stuck in Congress for months now. He also stressed the importance of air defense systems. Now, U.S. officials have recently warned that Ukraine is running out of ammunition for its air defense systems systems and will run out by the end of March. And at some point, Ukraine will only be able to shoot down one out of five uh, missile uh, that is targeted, it, targeting its cities. Magumi, very briefly, Poland saying it scrambled fighter jets to uh, the Ukrainian border in response to this uh, latest barrage. What's the significance of that? Well, first of all, Poland is a member of the NATO alliance, and this is not the first time Poland, a NATO member, has had to scramble its uh, fighter jets uh, during a Russian missile attack against Ukraine. The most recent was on March 24th, when a Russian cruise missile aimed at the western Ukrainian region of Lviv entered Polish airspace, reportedly for about 39 seconds and crossing about two kilometers across the Polish border. According to the Polish defense minister, all of its air defense systems were activated, uh, but it, and it said that it was ready to shoot down the missile if there were any indications that the target was located inside Russia. Now, this incident has prompted NATO to even have discussions on, on how it would respond. And two days after the incident, it said that it is considering shooting down Russian missiles that stray too close to a NATO member border. Megumi, thank you for that. Our correspondent Megumi Lim in Kyiv. Meanwhile, a Russian fighter jet has crashed into the sea off Crimea. Let's talk to our correspondent Dasha Chernyshova, watching events for us uh, in Moscow. Dasha, what uh, more do we know? Well, according to the governor of Sevastopol, Mikhail Razvazhayev, it was indeed a military plane that uh, has uh, crashed off the coast of Sevastopol. The pilot has managed to eject himself. Uh, he landed in about 200 meters away from the coast of Sevastopol, and the coast, uh, coast uh, rescue services have been able to reach this pilot. He is fine. According to Razvazhayev, uh, there has been no damage to the civilian infrastructure in the area. I'm afraid that's all we know that's, uh, with regards to this incident. It is also alleged that it was indeed an SU-35. But keep in mind that Sevastopol is often uh, a target of the Ukrainian attacks. Most recently, there was the large attack by the Ukrainian armed forces on the 24th of March, when uh, about 10 uh, missiles have been intercepted by the Russian air defense systems. Uh, separately um, to this story, Russia blocking the uh, renewal of the United Nations monitoring of international sanctions on North Korea. That's right. Moscow has put its veto uh, over the UN Security Council's resolution that was supposed to extend the main date of the group of experts that were monitoring the sanctions against North Korea over its nuclear program. Now, according to the Russian side, this is an old approach which is no longer uh, efficient. Moscow says it is only contributing to the escalation of the tensions on the Korean Peninsula while not helping to uh, build trust, to build any sort of confidence or uh, spark uh, and uh, somehow promote political dialogue. Instead, Moscow says the uh, so-called uh, group of experts of the UN Security Council 1718 Committee uh, has lost all standards of objectivity and impartiality. This is how the spokesperson for the Russian Foreign Ministry, uh, Maria Zaharova, has described it. Moscow is saying that there has to be a different mechanism that will be setting these specific conditions that will be allowing for these sanctions against North Korea to actually be revised and eased over 
over time. Uh, otherwise, Moscow says uh, the Western countries are only escalating the tension on the Korean Peninsula, and this is counterproductive. Dasha, thank you for that. Our correspondent Dasha Chernyshova in Moscow. Gang violence in Haiti continues to cripple the country's economy as the island country struggles to shed its reputation as the poorest country in the Caribbean. Our correspondent Dan Collins reports. Ever since over the armed gangs launched a coordinated assault on Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, one month ago, criminals have had a stranglehold on the seaport, airport and roads. Haiti's second largest city, Cap Haitian, has a port but it's struggling to get supplies from the capital. The worst thing is the supply of fuel, because we, as a construction and transporting company, our, our base, basic needs is fuel. And once you don't have fuel, it's really hard. Fuel prices keep rising, and, and uh, the prices is extraordinarily high nowadays. Diesel is so scarce, it sells for about four times what it costs in the US bringing much of this colonial city to a halt. Mayor Patrick Almanor says the tourism hub has seen a huge drop in visitors. The crisis has a really big negative impact on Cap Haitien. Tourism, cultural activities and even planning were the first to suffer because the city had to cancel a lot of events that were already planned to take place this year. A lot of people from the Haitian diaspora were ready to come to Haiti, but they had to cancel because there were no flights. Without the year-round festivals and events, the hotel sector is also suffering. The Retrovayas Hotel has a capacity of 50 guests, but its rooms are empty, says manager Karine Bell. Um, but she says the city yeah. still has security. We have a beautiful city, a very touristic place where people feel safe to go around. So I would love to invite everybody to come to Haiti as well when things calm down. Haiti is on the same island as the Dominican Republic, a country that has had different fortunes, though they share much of the same resources. The average annual income in the Dominican Republic is 10 times higher than Haiti, and its economy is one of the fastest growing in Latin America. Haiti's political instability, on the other hand, has made it the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. The beaches of northern Haiti are a major tourist attraction, but there are only locals here at the moment. The crisis in the capital has shut down airports and hotels and scared away tourists. Meanwhile, in the neighboring Dominican Republic, the beaches are full of visitors. The hotel owner on this beach says he's closing up. I'm closing the hotel and I just keep the beach and the restaurant to keep my uh, worker, you know, the people, my employee with me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the, the worst thing in that is I, I don't see an issue. Uh, something happening, you know, I don't see the future. It looks like paradise, but the lack of any stability and security is not only bad for tourism, it's bad for Haitians. Dan Collins, CGTN, in Cap Haitian, Haiti. University academics have become the latest group to join striking junior doctors in South Korea in a row over increased medical school admissions. South Korea's government says it will suspend the licenses of striking junior doctors next week unless they return to work. Our correspondent Jack Barton reports. South Korean medical professors tending resignations en masse in support of a more than month-long strike by resident doctors over the government's plan to boost medical school admissions by 2,000 placements a year. It is clear that increasing medical school admissions will not only ruin medical school education, but cause our country's health care system to collapse. Despite resigning, these professors, who also work as senior doctors at hospitals, say they will remain on the job for now with reduced hours. Outpatient treatment needs to be gradually scaled back, and I think that's the best option at the moment for patients as well, because doctors have to use our ability to focus on hospitalized, emergency and severely ill patients first. 
Seoul's five big hospitals are already under emergency management, running a combined loss of almost 750,000 US dollars a day, having already closed many wards and drastically reduced or cancelled surgeries, along with treatments such as chemotherapy. Patients' rights groups warn the strike is causing deaths and untold suffering. The government says that the medical student increase is needed to deal with the current shortage of doctors here in Seoul in areas like obstetrics, pediatrics and emergency medicine, as well as a dire shortage of doctors in rural areas. 76% of citizens polled say they support the government plan. I understand the position of the doctors, but there are many people who are in difficult situations and many people who are sick, so the government and the doctors must cooperate well and consult well so they can move forward in a smooth way. But if they resign like this, I think they would take the patients hostage, so I'm more opposed to the strike now. I'm against a doctor's strike. I feel so heavy every time I watch the news, because it seems like they're fighting by using patients in a serious condition, such as infants and the elderly. Medical groups and the government have finally started communicating, though there is still no sign of a breakthrough to the impasse or even serious talks in sight. Jack Barton, CGTN, Seoul. The headlines again. Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will send new delegations to Egypt and Qatar for talks on a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of Israeli hostages. Our other headlines, at least 70 more Palestinians are killed in the latest attacks on Gaza amid further warnings of famine. And power plants damaged and civilians injured. Kyiv says Moscow has launched another attack on its energy infrastructure. And that is The World Today. Thank you for watching. We're back with more news at the top of this hour. Coming up next, it's World Insight. For now, from all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Hello and welcome to your Twitter forecast. Let's see what will happen over this weekend. From Saturday into Sunday, there could be still rain chances stretching from Iberian Peninsula into Western Europe all the way to southern portion of Northern Europe. There could be localized sleet or probably heavy snow for northern portion of Norway, Sweden, all the way to Finland. On the contrary, notice plenty of sunshine could be expected in places like Belarus, Ukraine, Poland, and all the way down to the Balkans. Actually, you could have a warming trend across much of the continent over this weekend. For example, the single digits for daily highs across northern Europe and from the eastern portion all the way to central portion. And daily highs could be ranging from mid-teens all the way to lower 20s. Eventually, for folks down to the Balkans, certain spots could even have upper 20s to lower 30s for daily highs. And your business and travel out to look by Sunday, see showers for London 16 to 5 and light rain for Paris with day high of 18, down to Madrid 11 to 3, also light rainfall and back to Lisbon 16 to 10 rain chances, so you better keep your umbrellas handy. Eventually moving to Central Europe, Brussels for example, 18 to 5 light rain, also 18 for the maximum temperature for Berlin. But that's it for now, stay tuned for more city forecast.